Hi, it's um to think of what day it is it's wednesday october 4th uh where we are um talking about free fruit for young widows um from this book uh the new diaspora the changing landscape of american jewish fiction but before we do that we were talking about um parking and izzy lives near here and parking here during the the high holy days is you know impossible in and out so um i worked at emmanuel in the city and uh, it wasn't so easy parking there. So we go into the first service and someone comes up to me and said, oh, Vanessa, I loved your bulletin article. And I said to my dad, look, somebody read my article. He's like, mm. we go out to the car he go, and he looks around. He goes, there's 10 parking spots. You have a rever you have a reserved spot. He goes, that I'm impressed with. <laughs> That's fantastic. And then I, I told this story recently, and now we have parking for staff, but you don't put rabbi, educator, because of security. Oh, that's true. Nobody, no, I mean, I don't think they should, but, you know, if somebody is going to make trouble or wanted to pick out, you know, which is the rabbi's car, which is the cantor's car. And so that's where we are in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Listen, we 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 hired someone to sit at the door to let you all in. Of course. You know, my no, daughter, that's the way it is today. Um, so um at 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 Bev's uh I'm sorry, at Sue's um Oh yeah, BJBE has right Bethel, Am Shalom. And right. I, I will tell you that here, um, I think they now have a gun after Tree of Life. I think they should. After Tree of Life. That's when, you know, people said, oh, yeah. July 4th. I'm like, no, after Tree of Life. Yeah. And when Tree of Life happened at that synagogue, and it, you know, was terrible. I said to, to my girlfriend, I said, this is going to be hours and hours of meetings and security and money. You know, money... Now, Listen, I think we have to do it, but you know, that's money you could spend on programming, money you could spend on X, Y, and Z, which is why we, you know, have a Sunday. That's why we ask for a supplement. Anyway, um, on Sunday, we um the author of this book, the Sassoons. Thank you for me. Um, if you want the recording, I can send it. If you want to check this out, let me know. I thought he was fantastic. And um, if you heard it, he, there's beautiful pictures in here. The Sassoons were um, really more influential than the Rothschilds. Mm. And of course, I said to my husband, you know, Arthur's like the canary in the coal mine. He goes, I never heard of the Sassoons. I said, I know. That's why we're having the author. I love the recording. Okay, I will I will send it to you. Okay. Me too. Okay. Yeah, it's on YouTube, right? It's on YouTube. But I'll I'll send it out. I'll send it out. Because, you know, I like to, I like to rack up. I like to rack up. Yeah, I'm just going to send it to everybody. Thank you. Um, and he's a professor at Georgetown. And I like all of our speakers. Okay, some more than others. But when they're professors, they know how to speak to the audience. They know how to do the PowerPoint. It's in a, you know, um, a course. So Arthur watched it on Sunday and then he started doing research and he goes, oh, opium trade. <laughs> I said, nobody brought that up. I did, I remember. And I don't know if I would have had the balls to say, hey, yeah. that money was made on opium. But, you know, in the 1600s, everybody did that. Where was he from? Spain? No, Baghdad. Baghdad. He was born in Baghdad and he speaks Arabic. Um is Hebrew, English, French. He he was amazing. There were some wonderful specials on the opium trade at some point. Yeah, I'll have to look. Okay, let's go on to our, let's see what I got up here. So our, um, it's Nathan Englander, and I don't know if you've- We've done it before. We've done it yes, before. we have, and I've read actually this story before. Um, and it's from- this is what he looks like. I'll show you here. This is what he looks like. I'll send this around. He's handsome. <laughs> I like to pick, the, not, not that I picked it, but who doesn't like a handsome author? And his 
I don't, um, I will tell you. I will. Yes, that was, that was a, um, 10 years ago. Um, uh, this, <clears throat> I will tell you exactly where he's from. He is 52. He's from West Hempstead, New York. He lives in Toronto. And right now, well, I'll just read it. Na yeah, right now, um, he, he, um, he was born in West Hempstead on Long Island and grew up there as part of the Orthodox Jewish community. He attended the Hebrew Academy in Nassau, Nassau County for high school. He went to the State University of New York at Binghamton, SUNY Binghamton, the Iowa Writers Workplace. A lot of people go there. In the mid 1990s, he moved to Israel where he lived for five years. He lives in Toronto with his wife, Rachel, and his two children. He formerly lived in Brooklyn, New York, Madison, Wisconsin. He taught fiction at SUNY Hunter College and a master's of fine arts program in writing. And he has a lot of awards. The book that um, I highly recommend, his third book, when we talk, uh, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank. And that's the title short story. And uh, I should, you know, if I, if I find it online, maybe we'll just do it. If, yes, yeah. I mean, that, that yeah, may, not with me, that story, was yeah okay um yeah it, i will that that story i will never forget because they talk about you know if if there were nazis now where would you go hide and i remember thinking that as a kid because i read anne frank um, in sixth grade in Crystal Lake, Illinois, and there were no other Jewish kids. And, you know, the teachers asking me, you know, I was 12. I mean, I was articulate and smart, but I, you know, I wasn't a teacher. Anyway, um, and from a young age, oh, this is my other favorite story. Miss Hen, who only wore purple. She said to me when I was 10 in fifth grade, fifth grade, she said to me, Vanessa, I know what Hanukkah is, but what is Chinooka? <laughs> and I was like Chinooka, Chinooka, Chinooka. And then I said, Miss Han, that's just another way to spell it. I, so I, I was used to being put on the spot for that type of thing. And our picture was on the cover of the Herald, you know, my sister and I lighting the menorah. But um, um, but let, let's get to our uh let's get to our uh free fruit for young widows. Did you like the story? Yes. Yeah. I liked it. I really liked it. Some of his stuff is really out there. And he, um, you know, he just kind of lays it all out there for you. Um, but I looked up some reviews. Free Fruit essentially consists of three stories. A troubling incident of the past that even more troubling incidents that preceded it. And the way in which a man reacts to both episodes. So a young boy, Edgar, in the story, the recipient of the lesson is taught by his father's tales. Um, he's not alone. Now, I do want to go back in history for a hot minute and talk about um, um, the 73 war. That's the war where the, or is it the Sinai? 56. 56. So, you know, they're in the Sinai. And uh, when we, when you think about war now, and um, in Israel, do you remember when Fitbits came out? All the Israeli soldiers had them. And th the intelligence of the Arab countries could see where they were clustered. Because it's, you know, you can crack into that. So they said, you can't wear that anymore. I mean, now, you know, when kids and their kids are at the front, they can call home. You know, they have cell phones. They have, but in 56... That's obviously they had none of that. And if you if you get caught there, you know, you have no way of um, of getting help. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. 2019, yeah. but obviously I'm stuck. He's in Gaza during the war. And he was doing reconnaissance in the caves that they had dug from Gaza into the Kibbutzim. 
and they had to give up their cell phones because they didn't want anything to pay them. Exactly, they exactly. They had to give up their cell phones when they were in Gaza. Yes, yes. It, it's it's absolutely horrible. It's absolutely horrible. Um, so what? Tell me what you thought about how the dad, um, how the dad handled the story. You know, he killed someone. Why did he kill someone? Um, um, Joyce and then Ellen. I like how he cursed his out until he was thirteen and yes. pushed him open. Yeah, Joyce liked it that uh, he parsed it out till he was 13. I think that right. it was very wise of him. And I think, um, it, again, in 2023, sometimes, you know, our kids see stuff and we want to jump in and explain it all. And you don't, you know, you only answer what they ask. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, all right, we got to end I unmuted you, Andy. Go ahead. Oh, I would just add one short thing. I think he taught by example. And as a child, he could see what he was doing, and that led to the questions. It was so appropriate. So, yeah. Taught by so, example. Yeah. Um, I think in Ellen. Well, I, I was going to say the same thing, but it, the way he did it, but I think it's also a very good technique of storytelling. Yes. You see the, you, you know. A good technique of storytelling. You know, you know that, that he's been very um, abused, but you never get, you don't, he, he's telling you this whole story as it goes. And he's right. elongates the whole thing. Um, Sue Ellick. Um, I, I liked especially the way the father was teaching his son the moral lessons. Yes. I, I, I just thought it was a wonderful story of um, the father teaching moral lessons. Morality. Um, I, I really like this story. Yeah. yeah. I, I think um, as we watch what's happening in Israel now, um, and for me with a broken heart, um, to see everybody, uh, you know, um, protesting in the streets, um, quick quick commercial about Israel. This weekend at Dalton Richmond Virtual is Alan Green's son, Richard Green. Uh, Richard, who grew up at Solal, and he's the bureau chief, CNN bureau chief in Jerusalem. You are not going to want to miss that. His mother also did the Holocaust. He's going to be here in, he's going to be here in December. It's the Green family at Dalton Richmond. Uh, right, right. Um, but as we see as we, what's happening in Israel, you know, it breaks our heart, but there are things that happen every day, just like there are here, you know, where it is a Jewish state and they do know about Sadaka and there is a moral code. And, you know, um, that for me, that saves what's happening in the Knesset and, you know, yesterday. No, what there happened? A, is at, the, at the wall, there was a, um, Young, there was an older Jewish man, and then some young, very religious kids, and they saw the Christians there, and they spit on. Them. Oh, they spit they on Christians. Were they arrested? They, they were arrested. Yeah, they spit on Christians. Good. And this was so bad, and they, they didn't police. I guess didn't know. But I'm happy. They were spitting on Christians. Yes, yeah. they were spitting on Christians. I'm happy to know that they were arrested because an older man did it, and the younger kids did it. Horrifying. It is absolutely horrifying, and at least they're policing themselves. I'm um, Alice then Joyce. Yeah, I I was just so taken. I thought he was so um, able. He he on page three forty one he talks about Israel, but I looked. He wrote this story in twenty twelve, mm -hmm. but it 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 really spoke to me in terms of what's going on. The sentence is, Shimmy did his best. It's the second paragraph. Shimmy did his best to make clear to his son that Israelis in their nation of unfinished borders and unwritten constitution were trapped in a gray space that was called real life. And I think to me that epitomizes what's going on now. And I mean, all these Israelis, they're, they're dealing with their day-to-day -day lives but um, it's um, defined 
by these two huge things, unfinished borders and unwritten constitution. And so they have to make their way um, somehow. It's right. It's, so yeah. even in, in 2012, when that was written, they've never had a constitution. They, I know. They do have a declaration of independence. Megillat Atzma'ut, you know, a Megillah is a scroll, the scroll of independence, um, but not having a constitution. And I think at this point, they'll never be able to have one, but that, that that's the, uh, that's for somebody else, not me. Um, Joyce. I was just going to say, we have a lot of family in Israel, and they sent us T-shirts. They're out there protesting every Saturday night. So they sent us T-shirts um, signifying some of the protest slogans. Yeah. And they wanted us to all put on, on the T-shirts and take a picture. Yeah. And send it back to them. Yeah. Saying even our American family is standing yeah. with us. So we did. Because we're all together for Shabbat dinner and my daughter. So we all put on the t shirts. Very nice. Very nice. They all have t shirts. Um, again, quick, quick commercial. Mm -hmm. On Monday, October 23rd, Anna, I have to look up her name, um, the head of the reform movement um, in, in Israel is going to be here to talk about the Israeli situation. Yeah, um, it's at it's the same as um adult enrichment. Nine thirty locks and bagels. Ten o'clock speaker. <laughs> it's a Monday. The Monday we have a, another speaker. The day before actually is Adam Mansbach who wrote the Golem in Brooklyn, and he also wrote um a very tongue in cheek children's book, um Go the F to Sleep, and it's it's like um. Good night. I know. <laughs> wow. Well, maybe in Florida it's out of, I'm sure it's out of the library in Florida. So, um, and it, it'll all be coming home and um, uh, it, it's, it, we have some really great speakers coming up. Um, so the story's prose is, mm -hmm. the story's prose is smooth and unobtrusive, allowing the plot to do the heavy lifting. This is not to say the prose is dreadfully plain, but it is not at all, just that it steps to the side, continues simply, and allows the story within free fruit for young widows to take center stage. Englander's story is one of philosophy, of moral codes. It asks who governs right, wrong, and more importantly, how these questions are answered by people of different backgrounds. Um, and I think we're at a very, um, this morning, a uh, very fascinating point in United States history. Um, I I'd love to read that. You know who who asks who governs right and wrong, and more and more importantly, how these questions are answered by people of different backgrounds. Um, you know, in the United States Congress, um, watching it is just absolutely painful. Um, and even you know trying to explain it is. Uh, you really can't explain it. It's just terrible. Um, so um, conflicting judgments are passed as a result um, of the judge's age, personal history, and nationality. This story expects each reader to respond differently to each moral question. Thoughts? History expects each reader to respond differently? Um, this story expects each reader. Um, so... Um, Sue Roberts and then Merle. So, so um, verse in Psalm. Um, <laughs> again, uh, <laughs> this story reminded me, having taken classes with Rabbi, um, reminded me of the types of arguments that are presented in the Torah. I felt like I was reading a modern day version of all the little things. And now with his orthodox background, it kind of fits, it kind of fits into mm -hmm. place. Yeah. Place. Yeah. That was so it, it struck me. So um yeah, go ahead. Um there was one other sentence that uh, 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 yeah. 
Even absolutes can maintain more than one position. There is the lens through which you see everything is your background and your and sitting right next to me is going to be a different lens. Even mm -hmm. absolute. Um, I have Merle than Izzy. Merle. Hey, I think the story talks about what it really means to be a committed soldier. The professor Tendler was a really committed soldier, and he didn't he didn't seem to worry about gradations of right and wrong. And when Edgar asks the question of his father, you know, how did this justify a beating as fierce as the one his father got from Professor Tendler? I think that really opens up the story to answer that question. And, and certainly Professor Tendler, as he was a committed soldier without any kind of gradations of right and wrong, he knew as a soldier what he thought was right. And the rest of us could be talking about it as if it were Talmud. We could be, you know, arguing for hours about this. But I think the boy's question opens up the whole story. Um, Izzy. I was going to say, the way the story is written, when you first hear about what Tendler did to um, Shimmy, you form a, an opinion of like, why did he have to kill him? Why couldn't he just shoot him, whatever? But as the story revealed, little by little, yeah. you begin to understand his rage when you find out about his past whole family. And then you have a different opinion. I found myself at the beginning and at the end coming to completely different opinion as I read the book. Uh, read the story. It's just dawned on me. <laughs> and I knew this from the beginning, but the child's name, Edgar, yes. yeah. it means challenge. Oh, oh. And now that I say, I mean, that just kind of opens up a whole nother thing. And why do I know that the high ropes courses at Az Azrui are called Edgar Challenge and all the kids call them Edgar. I'm like, it's not Edgar, it's Edgar. Anyway, um, I have Izzy then Sue. Oh, right. I have Abby then Sue. Okay. Oh, okay. First of all, I wanted to, what, what, struck, what struck me, first of all, in reading was the name Edgar. Um, and I just heard what it meant, and I was really, this summer when Rabbi spoke about it, and our grandson was fortunate to go on this wonderful program called Edgar. Right. Um, with, and he didn't know the name, what it meant either, in terms of challenges and challenging different issues. Well, tell tell them what Edgar is, the, the program. Oh, okay. oh, it was a bus trip that started in Atlanta, and it was about uh, 30, 38 days of kids from across the, well, there was a rough country, I'm not sure where they were from, but it was a bus trip that went all the way, starting to the south, going all the way to the west coast, they came back to Chicago, they flew back to Chicago, got back on the bus two days later and did the east coast, but they talked to people from all different political, political backgrounds, and with the idea that you can have all these discussions and still have fun together and have dinner together. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, Joshua just turned 17, so it's home since when you... It's high school kids. It's high school kids. But I understand he is doing one for adults this winter. But yeah. I'm, I'm sharing it with the people online. There's adults, private and public school, but it's an interesting... Um, you know, get on the road and learn about history, politics, and activism. I mean, Joshua gave us um, a two, two hour and 45 minute presentation on this uh, after he came back with all the notes. Oh. He, so it was phenomenal. It really kind of, I mean, he's always had an interest, but it opened up his mind a lot. But but the idea that all these difficult, I mean, when they went to APAC and um, um, J Street, J Street the, same, the same day, they talked to, uh, people who were incarcerated for different things in the past. It was just across the board. Yeah. But uh, so that spoke to me right away. But the other thing, to paraphrase T. Roberts, um, I certainly don't have a Talmudic background, but I also don't have too much of a, I have a Buddhist background. But the idea of how can I see things differently spoke to me. And also, I think something about, even for the narrator, we see things differently or can explain things differently with the passage of time. Mm -hmm. um, 
as mm -hmm. as a child growing up in a in a Jewish day school and um nothing ever and being the child of a survivor um and nothing ever being said about the Holocaust and I didn't know what you know what I was feeling or anybody to talk to about it and then all of a sudden you know 20 years later having Yom HaShoah be this big thing I mean that was startling for me and then I and it's only more recently that I found this to be a little less painful because I understand you need the passage of time to be able to discuss a lot of things so I, I can see that in the story as well we know both from the narrator as well as uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Sue Wallach, then Alan. Um, so I can't tell you what page this is on. Because oh, you're on a Kindle. I'm reading. Yeah. Oh, give me the page. Uh, but um, when after um, he finds out the horrible beating that his father got from Professor Tendler, mm -hmm. um, and this is the father's lesson to him, which to me is just almost the whole story. Even if the violence had been justified, even if his father didn't always say, you must risk your friend's life, your family's, your own, you must be willing to die, even to save the life of your enemy. If ever of two deeds, the humane one may be done. It was not his father's act of forgiveness, but his kindness that baffled as God. Oh, and his kindness um, baffled the boy. Not that he forgave him. Right. I just, um, to me, that paragraph yeah. almost tells the whole story. Yeah. Giving him kindness and yeah. Something. Yeah. And, you know, it made me think, I don't know how many of you heard the interview with Merrick Garland. No. Um, oh, it was just on 60 Minutes. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to really. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll stay with me. And and the Holocaust, and the man was moved to tears. Yeah. Uh, and talking about this country today and how we need to behave. Yeah. I thought when reading this book, too, it yeah. just all yeah. came together for me. Yeah, I'm going to have to look that up. Um, Ellen. I can't jump into it totally. That's okay. <clears throat> the thing that left me that was so sad was when he got out of the concentration camp and he's talking about that and he sees this house and the people that helped raise him and he really wants a family and he hears them mm -hmm. talking about how they were children. Mm -hmm. And they're talking and it kind of shows the anti-Semitism. Yep. And they're the hypocrisy. people yeah. let them take all the Jews and they were thrilled that they got the property and the houses and they were going to kill them. I, and I that was so shocking to me. Right. I don't it wasn't shocking to me. Oh I don't think it was as black and white um that they had that they thought through, oh my God, if the if the Germans take them, I can take their house. But I do think that um they didn't, you know, stand up like they did in Norway. They didn't stand up. Well, I can only think of Norway. Well, Denmark, were, thank you. In Denmark. Care. They weren't gonna protect them. They're right. Anti-Semitism. Right. So right. Right. And it just shows what the people were like at that time. Okay, right. The Jews are gone. Right. It doesn't matter to me. And so how he got there and the killing part was very disturbing. Right. But I understand kind of how he got there. Yeah. He, uh, and for, yeah. Sandy. I hate to say this because I believe it's this year that you're planning to go to Poland. We are planning but, to go to Poland. I did it already. Yeah. I went to Krakow without a group. Mm -hmm. Just privately. Mm -hmm. My husband and I, we, we spent a long time in Krakow and the environs back and forth from the camps to Krakow and the little towns, the salt mines. I don't ever want to be there again. Yeah. I, I don't think a lot has changed. These people saw nothing, heard nothing, smelled nothing. They didn't even have anything to do with the Holocaust. Yeah. That's the way they talk around Krakow. Right. And it's just a few miles from um, Auschwitz, probably. Auschwitz, yeah. Um, I have Andy, then Joyce. No, I'm going to just respond to Sandy and then go back. But I think that is the nature of all of us. 
Mm. That is how we don't look at what's happening a mile away. There's a beautiful Mary Oliver poem about that, you know, that it, it, there's a snowstorm a mile north and everybody's getting hurt. But, you know, we're playing in the snow. What else can we do? And we do this all the time. So it's not just them. And there was just a thing in the Times two weeks ago about this um, huge, uh, in Seneca Falls, this garbage dump that is 300 feet high, like the Statue of Liberty. And someone said, well, it's a smell, but, you know, it's not a hazard. You know, I mean, it's just that, but I, I'm going to go back to the book. So um, yeah. uh, I agreed 100% with Sue. That was exactly how I felt. And I also thought that just as far as the beating goes, that when you heard his story and we talk, it was already mentioned that everybody brings something different and has a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And you cannot possibly, none of us know every step of his background, you know, brought him to that and good soldier, bad soldier. I don't know if I agree with that part of it. I just think that he, you know, he is, he, he was at that point from the, his history, what brought him there? You know, how do you know what you do? How you yeah. lose? What's yeah. a trigger? What's a trigger? Well, yeah. What's a trigger? I do find that now when I read um, and I look at reviews there or the beginning of a book, trigger warnings, you know, like that there's um, violence or rape or uh, medical trauma or, and I was, you know, that is a very 2023 thing. You did, you know, when you, when you read, um, you know, Gone with the Wind, <laughs> which which i don't i reread part of it 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 doesn't quite hold up okay. yeah there's certain things that you go back and you're like mm. I love this so much. yeah exactly you were 12. Uh, right 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 um you know um although anna green gables and <laughs> that does hold up anyway uh so uh, yeah i'm joyce i'm sorry um i had a different experience than Chris. And um, maybe because I was on the floor, and um, I was impressed by the uh, number of Holocaust memorials that were put up and the efforts that were made to. Um, memorialize what had happened in World War II, and uh, maybe I'm naive. I was impressed. And well, I, I, I wanted to be right. I think I was looking for right. The, Rose right. You have to go back and read Nathan Englander's um what you what we think when we talk about Anne Frank, but um there's many righteous Gentiles. And they're memorialized at Yad Vashem. And I have a dear friend of the family um, and his parents who are not living anymore, Aaron and Lisa Derman from Poland, talk about it all the time. But it was one guy who saved them. You know, there were hundreds, thousands, 100,000 of people who didn't, you know. And so it's hard to, you know, how does that all balance out? And, you know, there's stories upon stories of um, sometimes the nuns helped um, and sometimes the priests did not. And so it's it, it's very difficult. I remember um, Arthur and I went through Europe in uh, 1980 and we were in one of those. We took a night train. We had no money. <laughs> we were staying. When I think about the places where we stayed anyway. Um, but I remember we crossed a border and they woke everyone up and they're like passports. And my heart was beating. This is in 1980. I was safe. I had an American passport. But there is just something about. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and and looking at old people and thinking, well, where were you during the war? And what did you do during the war? I mean, now, it, you know, we can't you know, punish the children for the sins of the mainly fathers. But um, it, it's, uh, and I, 
we are going to Poland this year. I have never been. Um, and I think it's important to, um, you know, see what's there. And I, I, it'll be very interesting. I know that there's an active JCC in Krakow. And I mean, there's certain things. And Israelis are going back to Berlin in droves. Germany is another story. Germany. Everyone was born after 49 yeah. in Germany. You can be with them and you will feel, you will feel that they care about you and yeah. your people. Yeah. People who are older, very different. Yeah. Very different. Yeah. Than, I've sat on trains. I've been to Germany four times. I've sat on trains with people and I always have to tell them I'm Jewish. Doesn't matter where. I tell the waiters in restaurants. <laughs> I tell a shopkeeper. Yeah. Who finds them. Yeah. We're Jewish. Yeah. And you see the difference. The young ones are wonderful. They have been educated in their schools. They are sorry for what their parents and their grandparents put up with. And they will do anything for you, anything for you. Just three weeks ago, we had four German visitors here. They were all born with after the war. They stayed at my daughter's house and we took them around to the Botanic Garden. And they took me aside and the one woman said, Sandy, do the Jewish people here still hate us? Do they blame us yeah. for the war? I said, they don't blame you. You were born yeah. in 1950, the early 50s. I said, they'll never forget what happened because of the Germans and the Nazis. But nobody hates you here. And they had such a wonderful time in days. What gifts and they said thank you notes and yeah it is it's absolutely it's very different. Okay, I have Andy, Sue, and then Sue. Hmm. Andy, go ahead. I, I just want to say that, that I guess I'm devil's advocate, but you know, how many Jews in this country didn't uh, some didn't want the refugees, some didn't do it. I mean, I there's enough to that it's significant, and I think. You know, there's good people and bad people. There's people that do wonderful things and there's people and it doesn't necessarily um, coincide with, you know, what you are. It, it's who you are and not your background. So I think it's just it, it, better not to generalize. Right. Um, Sue Wallach, Sue Roberts and Alice. Okay, so um, I too, Sandy, I'm been to Germany many I can't even count how many times mm -hmm. because my husband did a lot of business there. And um, it's amazing, and especially in Berlin, what they have done to memorialize what their forefathers had done. Uh, and they're very apologetic. Um, and as far as that, um, I volunteer at the Holocaust Museum here. And we had a speaker who was the um, of the JCC in Krakow. He is the head of the JCC in Krakow. Yeah, he, cool. He was making yeah. the tour of the yeah. United States. Yeah. And he told us that the Jewish community there is living very happily and very safely mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's, a, um, wait one second. I, right. Um, Sue Robert. No. Oh, sorry. Alice. And then Merle. Yeah. Um, I think this might be um, the couple, it's on page 341. I guess that's a, that's a big, a big page. page. Um, <laughs> but I think this might, you know, I know um, Sue Wellick's reading on the iPad, but whatever, I think it's around what she'd read, but it goes to what you said in a little bit, Andy, what you said, um, Edgar was searching for black and white, but he couldn't find it because these issues aren't black and white. And as you were saying before, um, Vanessa, you know, everybody look at um, both Shimmy and Professor Tendler, they both survived the Holocaust, but each of their stories were completely different. And so, um, and then at that next paragraph after um, Edgar says he's searching for black and white, he says, the man saved his father's life, but maybe he hadn't. And he goes up and back and up and back. And I think that is, you know, um, an example to all of us, to, as you were saying, Andy, not 
and I, I know I have a hard time with this, not to be so judgmental and to start, you know, to think, well, this person experienced this and that person experienced that and what and how that affects the rest of your life. And and so, um, yeah, it's it's I, I think he this author does a, in just a few pages does such a wonderful job of bringing up all these subtleties and how it's hard for all of us to navigate through it. You just have to try. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Merle, Ben, Izzy. And I think it raises the question, how do you recognize the enemy? My husband and I were in Israel in 1999 at a bat mitzvah in Jerusalem, and we had a car and we were driving toward Tel Aviv. They stopped us because my husband is super tan. He's always like, he's a sun worshiper. They thought he was an Arab. So we had to show our, our um, passports and they put a little red circle sticker in his passport. And then when we drove away, I ripped off that sticker. I what do you think that was for? Uh, because just that he was checked to see if he was an Arab or, or an enemy. He wasn't. He was just a Jewish man who was a tan. You know. But the, the thing I wanted to say about the book is the father says to the boy, you have to understand why the professor did what he did. There's this hazy morality of combat. There are split second decisions and there's the assessment of threat. And so it's sort of the split. Are these enemies? He thought they were, so he shot them. And then he says to the boy, may you never have to be tossing between right and wrong like a fish flopping, like a fish flip flopping under the mallet. Yeah, I mean, may you never have to make a horrible decision like this. And I think the father really saw both sides of the issue very clearly. And I think he set a great example for his son by explaining both sides. Yeah. Um, is he? But he did, he explained it in little bits and pieces so that Edgar didn't understand. So when he told him what he told him, Edgar had a lot of different questions, what's right and wrong. When he got to the end, you understood much more that he didn't even stop to think about not killing those people. He just mm -hmm. killed them. Mm -hmm. So at the time when I read that, I was horrified. And then later I understood why. If he had told them the story maybe all together when he was 12 or 13, that Echo was asking questions, he would have gotten a different, um, whole different mm -hmm. opinion about it. Yeah, It's just like you never know what you're going to do at a certain time. And you judged, and he judged, mm -hmm. Jimmy judged Edgar because he didn't know the background story. Mm -hmm. If he had known the background story, he might have felt differently right then and there. It was only later that he found out about what yeah. he was when I was in Germany, and I felt the same exact way. Yeah. I was very friendly. And in Vienna, when I was in Austria, we had a tour guide. This was about 12 years ago who we said to him, you know, we'd like to go where the, the Austrians go for lunch. He said, no, you people aren't allowed to. We reported him to the tour. Oh, company. good. Good, good, good. So it still, so it still exists. He what said, year was that? Said, you people, this was in about uh, 2005. Okay. No, no, 2000. Yeah. Okay. They wouldn't let him go to a play. He said to us, we said, we wouldn't want to go where regular Germans eat. We don't want to go to a touristy place. And he said, I can't take you there. You wouldn't belong. Blatantly. Not, no, I'm not surprised, no, people. There's not, it's not said, black and white. No, There's, and he was, he was not Exactly, he was exactly. Not this was Austria. This was, this was Austria. This is not Germany. Yeah, there you go. Um, I, I think that, um, I, I'm looking back. I'm looking back. So um, I did Hebrew U junior abroad, 7980. And I remember them talking, you know, mainly to the girls, but to the boys too, the young women, whatever, you know, to be careful of young Arabs who are impersonating Israeli um, military who would try to pick us up and that type of thing. And I was afraid. I was afraid and I would, you know, like dream about it and I'd have to be careful. And, um, and, um, you know, was that right or wrong? I'm not sure. And then I, I think about, you know, I've, I've been doing this a long time, but um, I, when I first started at Lakeside in 1989, I didn't think about who was coming into the building. I wasn't, you know, profiling people. I wasn't like looking and now, right. Well, first of all, we have security, but second of all, usually what happens when somebody, you know, 
whatever suspicious comes security picks it up and we pick it up and we're like did you see blah 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 and he's like yeah i'm on it I, you know what i know it's you know 2023 it's a long time um you know in between but you know things change and there's just you know not a black and white and i remember you know every time there is an inc- a national incident at a jcc tree of life that makes us, you know, look at our security protocols. And we once had, I don't know, you know, some police, some something. Sue, we'll see you next time. That's okay. It's okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so um, um, he said, you know, there's, it, I always have to think about how he said it to us, you know, low probability but if something happens, it's going to be a high, high risk. You know, we don't think that something, something's going to come in here or whatever. And um, again, if you had told me in 1989 that we're looking to make these like um, bulletproof, not bulletproof, but so that they, so it, shatter resistant. Thank you, Joyce. I don't even know why you know that, but um, <laughs> I, I need shatter resistant windows in my school. Uh, you know, and that's a sad thing. But um, as we're coming up, for me, um, the the thing that I liked the best um, was the last paragraph. Still, every Friday, Edgar packed up. I'm going to start crying. Right. Yeah. 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 Tendler's fruit and vegetables. And in that bag, Edgar would add... Um, when he had a pineapple or mangoes, dripping honey, handing it to Tendler, Edgar would say, Kah, Professor, take it. This even after his father had died. He learned the lesson. He learned the lesson and he followed his father's footsteps. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. And he never became, and he still right. had that stall, food stall. Right. He never left it. Right. So he must have had some unbelievable precious connection. Right. He had a connection to his father, father as he said, and that, you know, to me, that's hopeful, you know, Beautiful. that that's going to go on to the next generation. Um, and the reviewer said, England, Englander's story did not seem incredible when I set the magazine down, which I think is kind of mean. I thought it was very good, but had read many better. That's even meaner. Uh, the reviewer, I, I have to go look. Uh, um, you know why i think they just say that to get you know however my opinion of the piece improved greatly when i find myself wrapped up in many philosophical questions about the nature of murder in the context of war did that context excuse tendler's execution of egyptians who sat down for lunch questions of this nature still pester me proving free fruit for young window widows is a good story because like all the best one it stays with you and it does stay with you. So this is what I think. Right. They were pretending to be Israelis. Right. And he thought they were friend, all friends, but he knew they weren't. He knew that they were Egyptians. I think I could be wrong. He's remembering back to the people, the people. who who brought him into the house and said, "Oh," and then we're we're whispering, "We're going to kill you." They were friendly, and so friendly, friendly. they were just friendly, like the and then were, they were going to like just like the soldiers. And he's like, "I I can't. I have to kill them, or they're going to kill me." Correct. And they probably I don't think the soldiers were, were pretending to be Israelis. It said that the French uniform. Right. They were both wearing the same uniform. Yeah. He said. Mm-hmm. But they, they haven't done anything wrong at the end. No, but they no, right. Have, but they he thought they might have. Right, we, right. That's the whole question. The background said that. Yeah. Well, the yes. That came to Jerusalem. Right. That was 20, 30 years after that. But you, you should look also at it. He's a, he's in a soldier's uniform at that point. Mm-hmm. So he takes on a whole different. He's in a soldier's uniform. Uni- yes, absolutely. I'm um, Andy. I just, with that ending, to me, it was just a tribute to wonderful parenting. Yep. Yes. Oh, here, 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 here. Kyle, Kyle follows that code of ethics. You've done a good job. And I, I that's what I would really 
Yeah, I, I, I totally completely agree. And that he stayed in the fruit stand. I mean, that's not going to make him a millionaire, but um, it's something that we need. It's something certainly we need in Israel. Uh, Beverly, welcome, Beverly Rose. And um, any, do you have any, I'm going to, oh, do you want to unmute and ask anything? Or, or not? Okay. Um, and uh, uh, a any other comments? And then I have, yes, Beverly, just Beverly. This story a lot. And I guess if I was going to say it had a main theme for me, it was kindness. Oh, uh, yes. I, kindness. I, that's how I felt about this mm -hmm. story. Even, right. Even with the killing mm -hmm. and all the other parts of the history, it was a story of kindness. Yeah. I thought there was some sadness because when he came back to the house, all he wanted was a family. And he was going to be, those people were going to be his family. And he hears that they're going to kill him. To me, that was the saddest part of the whole story. That hmm. he was going to embrace these people and they were going to be his family. But don't you think, him. for me, a sad part was he he's then so damaged, he kills all the Egyptians. Yeah, there's some that damage. Sandy. Uh, when I read that part, you, I, you knew what was going to happen. Yeah, right? well, yeah. Was that tax freeze? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When Jews went back, mm -hmm. yes. they got out of the concentration camps and back to where their homes were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were mm -hmm. others that killed. I think yeah. there were thirty Jews that were killed in one town. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, unfortunately. You know, the the history of the Polish people is not great. Um, Izzy, then Beverly. You know, when I thought about him killing the baby, at first I was appalled. And then I thought, you know what? That kid would grow up. He would hear the story about this guy who killed his family. He'd hunt him down and kill him. Right. I mean, so that's, that's what they're trying. That was that's what they're trying to intimate. Um, Alice? No, no. I was just saying that's what the book says. That that's what Tendler was thinking. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, Beverly, you know, it isn't talked about so much, but the whole persecution of the Jews, a huge portion of it was monetary. Yes, yes, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Money, gold teeth and businesses and so. property and art and yeah. all that was confiscated. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it wasn't just anti Semitism that was worse, you know. I have a, I used to have a friend who was Catholic, who used to play bridge, and she thought all that art that belonged to Queen could have stolen in the museum. She just stayed there. She <laughs> used to say, hey, would you like them if they took all your furniture and they kept it? She didn't even get it. No, no. And that is still going on. <clears throat> you, I could read. There was something just in the. Yes, I could read a book a month about the Holocaust, and I could read a book a month about yeah. art stolen in the Holocaust oh, and recovery and movies, oh, everything. We don't have time. We don't have time, right? And, uh, you know, you said envy. I have always believed that all anti Semitism is based on the jealousy of these people. They are jealous of the Jews everywhere, everywhere in the world. But but the but the, a lot of the Polish Jews, yes, there was an aristocracy, but a lot of them lived in shadows. They were they were poor. They they the price of it. So, and that's the and they churches, had this the churches come and be the nursemaid to their kids. They had them come and even here we have Polish women come and clean our houses. Right. I had cleaning people when I first moved back from Israel, and I. To me, having a cleaning room is more important than going out for dinner, no matter how poor I am. Here, here. And it seemed like all that was available were Polish women out there. And we, after a while, I heard so many tell me how their grandfather had saved a Jew and all this yeah, stuff. Too. And I got to the point where no more Polish women in my house. People used to call Lisa Derman and say, can you tell them to blah, 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 because their English wasn't good. You know, a lot of them. Anyway, um, it's 1058. I want to remind everyone that um, our next one, um, more Israel, Scott Nadelson on Oslo. Well, I'm sure this is about the Oslo Accords and um, that'll be a good thing to talk about. 
Um, yeah, and <laughs> in person. We're going to be in person until unless there's weather or, you know. Happy to be in person. I thought yeah. we were alternating. Cool. No, we're going to be in person. I think it's just easier. It's too hard to remember. It, the date is, I can tell you. Yes, October 18th. 14th, 14th, right? 18th, 18th. October 18th, right. So in person at the temple? Yeah. Mm hmm um, and on and on um, Zoom. Now, I will tell you, we are um, looking to upgrade our technical and we're going to have a big screen in here that you'll be able to see them and hear and when I can put up pictures and that type of thing. But that but that's going to take a hot minute. <laughs> yes, we were in the lounge. Yeah. Um, well, I also thought it'd be I, you know, we don't, I don't know what the happening in the preschool. I could ask if you want to go back into, it was, we were in the community room. Yeah. I think this is just easier for us to hear. Yeah, I know we used to be. So um, welcome everybody. And um, don't forget, there's a lot of good things. Simchat Torah, Friday night, Yisker, Saturday, um, Richard Green, um, Sunday, and there's just so much going on. Check your Macomb at home. Hug some air. Hug some air. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. I know.